happy to be here. I've been to Ljubljana several times, and it's a beautiful city, even in the rain. Uh, and I'm really excited to be included in the uh, project that you have, learning about sort of systematically about artists and exhibitions in the art world in different places as you move through time. It's really important, I think, to understand uh, the context for uh, works of art, both in terms of its history and in terms of its context. This is the first time I'm using a iPad to read anything, so hopefully everything will go smoothly. Uh, so to understand the situation, oh, and if I speak too quickly, just you know, wave your hand, or if I use words that you can't understand from context, you can just interrupt me. It's totally fine. So to understand the situation for artists during the period 1890 to 1918, it's helpful to know a little bit about the previous very short history of American art, which began in the 18th century. The people who emigrated to America during the 17th and 18th centuries belonged to three different groups. Firstly, ambitious and adventurous individuals looking for economic opportunities. Sometimes they were the younger sons and families who would not inherit the wealth and had to find alternative sources of income. The second type were prisoners. The state of Georgia, for instance, and this explains a lot, uh, began as a prison colony. Uh, the third type, again, tells you a lot about America, were religious fanatics, uh, or at least individuals who belonged to minority and persecuted religious sects. These immigrants sought independence and freedom from oppression. Throughout Europe, many Protestant sects were formed during the Reformation in the 17th and 18th centuries, and some, like the Amish and the Quakers, emigrated to America to establish societies free from government or Catholic Church interference. Of course, it's important to remember that North America was fully settled by the time Europeans began arriving in the 17th century. Native Americans, or First Nation peoples, as they are sometimes called, were murdered, imprisoned, and forced to migrate to the least productive parts of the continent. But that is a story for another time. As a result of the kinds of people who settled in America, capitalists, not yet rich, prisoners, and religious fanatics, collecting art was not a very high priority. In addition, many Protestant religions discouraged the display of wealth. Even if you were rich, you should not show it in any obvious kind of way. For these reasons, the kind of art that was commissioned by colonists was mostly portraiture. And the majority of artists were either self-taught or learned through apprenticeships. They may have seen examples of a European art in prints, but they had no direct experience of European art traditions. As the aspiring artist John Singleton Copley observed in a letter to a colleague, quote, in this country, as you rightly observe, there is no example of art except one what one sees in a few prints that are indifferently executed and from which it is not possible to learn much, end quote. Although the colonies became increasingly civilized according to Western European standards, colonists, just as inhabitants in Eastern Europe and Scandinavia, considered themselves as peripheral and culturally inferior, a mindset that continued into the 19th century. Two artists born in the colonies became famous in Europe, John Singleton Copley and Benjamin West. Copley's parents came to America in the early 18th century and were uh, merchants and tobacco farmers. Oh, hang on. Copley grew up in Boston and apprenticed with a local portrait painter. Because of family connections and his skill, Copley was soon in great demand as a portraitist. 
He sent Boy with a Squirrel to London's Royal Academy exhibition in 1766, where it impressed critics and established his reputation as an outstanding artist. It impressed English academic artists so much that they elected him an honorary member of England's Society of Artists. In the 1770s, as revolution in America approached, uh, Copley's life was in danger because of his and his family's loyalty to England. For this reason, uh, he sailed to England in 1774, intending to return to America as soon it was, as it was safe. But by the time revolution ended in 1781, Copley was well established in London, and he decided to stay, and he died there in 1815. The other artist, Benjamin West, came from a Quaker family in Pennsylvania and went to Europe in 1760, a trip that was paid for by two wealthy patrons. Like Copley, he never returned to America. Although he earned his living mainly from portrait painting, he was a pioneer in the field of history painting. Agrippina with the Ashes of Germanicus was one of the first neoclassical paintings, exhibiting what Johann Joachim Winkelmann described as noble simplicity and calm grandeur. Um, West's biblical subject, Death on a Pale Horse, was one of the first romantic paintings, exhibiting the typical characteristics of fear, suffering, and death, as Irish philosopher Edmund Burke described in his influential 1757 essay, A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and Beautiful. West was undoubtedly the most internationally successful American artist before 1820. He was the founder of the Royal Academy in London, along with Swiss painter Angelica Kaufmann and English artist Joshua Reynolds, and was also the official painter to King George III of England. As in the Netherlands, art academies in America were established city by city. The first one was established by the mayor of New York in 1802. The American Academy of Fine Arts, as it was called, was structured according to European models so that finally the U.S. could become a respectable culture nation. The curriculum was based on the French system, as was that of the Pennsylvania Academy, which you see here, uh, Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, established in 1805 by the artist collector Charles Wilson Peale in Philadelphia which was the first capital of the United States. The Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts included a museum, which you see here, and offered classes in drawing after plaster casts and live models. Unlike most European academies, it also taught oil painting, which was not typical. Aspiring European artists usually had to get private lessons in oil painting, which is one of the main reasons that most artists either learn from family members or were wealthy and could afford to hire teachers. Importantly, the Philadelphia Academy also regularly hosted exhibitions. In Europe, for example, only Paris and London hosted uh, exhibitions regularly, sometimes annually, but at least biannually. The art academies in St. Petersburg, Berlin, Stockholm, Copenhagen, and Madrid uh, did, rarely had public exhibitions, making access to potential clients extremely difficult for artists who lacked social connections. In 1844, the Pennsylvania Academy began to offer classes for women, and in 1878, the first female professor was appointed. The New York Academy was more conservative, with plaster casts of ancient sculptures serving as the sole basis of study, no live models. By 1825, students didn't want to study there anymore because it was too conservative. Teaching was based on uh, fidelity to tradition rather than on creativity and individual vision, a trend that was slowly growing during the Romantic era in European academies. Thus, in 1825, a group of artists established the National Academy Museum and School in New York, 
which still exists today. The initiative was led by the landscape painters Asher B. Durand and Thomas Cole, both of whom belonged to what is known as the Hudson River School. This informal group of landscape painters got this name because they painted the nature surrounding the Hudson River just north of New York City. They were inspired, of course, by French painters working in the Barbizon Forest near Paris, such as Charles Daubigny and Camille Corot. Durand, Cole, and their colleagues intended the National Academy not merely as a city academy, but one that served the entire rapidly growing nation. The National Academy's mission was, quote, to promote the fine arts in America through instruction and exhibition, end quote. By 1875, this institution was also considered too narrow-minded by young artists. Remember, the 1870s was a decade when the Impressionist group was established, an event that triggered secessionist movements throughout Europe. As a result, the Arts Student League, Art Students League, was established. Its goal was to develop technical competence without dictating subject matter and style. It is still the most popular art school in New York, if not the United States, and has produced many successful artists, including Norman Rockwell, Thomas Hart Benton, Jackson Pollock, Roy Lichtenstein, Robert Rauschenberg, and Helen Frankenthaler, the pioneer of the soaking technique of image making on canvas. In 1889, three new organizations were founded in New York. The American Fine Arts Society, the Society of American Artists, and the Architectural League. Their joint headquarters were housed in the Art Students League building on West 57th Street in the heart of New York's first art district. Today, due to high rents, the galleries that remain in the mostly former art district are hidden in skyscrapers, and the action has moved downtown to Soho and, more recently, Chelsea. Among the Art Students League founders uh, was the realist artist Thomas Hart Benton, or excuse me, Thomas Eakins, who studied at the Pennsylvania Academy in Philadelphia and the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. He was the first artist to paint a medical operation, not a popular subject in general, but a work considered a masterpiece of American realism because it presented a gritty reality outside the academic canon. The Gross Clinic, where Eakins himself studied anat anatomy, you can see him uh, drawing uh, in the background. This painting made him famous when it was exhibited at the Exposition Universelle in Philadelphia in 1876, a World's Fair which, like Paris in 1889, celebrated the centennial of the nation's founding. Aikens began teaching at the Pennsylvania Academy in 1876. This is the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, but it looked probably pretty similar and his teaching style was extremely controversial. Of course, in America, there has always been a higher than usual tolerance for nonconformity because it's a young immigrant nation without deeply rooted traditions. In Aikens' classes, there was no drawing after sculptures. Instead, students received basic drawing instruction before learning about oil paints because Aikens believed that understanding color relations was just as essential knowledge for painters. He also encouraged students to use photography to aid in their study of anatomy. Aikens himself was a passionate photographer um, and found this practice useful, as you can see, in his own work. His teaching philosophy was this, quote, a teacher can do very little for a pupil and should be thankful only if he doesn't hinder him. The greater the master, the less influence he exerts over his students." 
end quote. Aikens believed that women should have the same opportunities as men, and his female students attended also anatomy and life drawing classes, although male models were wearing loincloths, but they, and they were separated, uh, segregated from the men. Aikens' painting, The Swimming Hole, depicts himself and his students uh, and, and is a masterpiece of realistic, realist figure painting. It was works like these that caused critics to question his sexuality, despite the fact that after 1884, he was married to fellow artist Susan McDowell. Of course, this does not mean anything, right? Uh, in fact, Aikens' sexuality is still one of the most popular topics among historians of 19th century American art. For all aspiring non-French artists in the late 19th century and early 20th century, the Paris Salon was the place to establish legitimacy. Interestingly, 15% of Americans living in Paris in the 1890s declared themselves as artists by profession. Some studied at the Academy, the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, either because it taught methods the students were interested in learning or because they thought it would be helpful to their careers. Others studied at one of the numerous private academies run either by members of the French Academy, such as Alexandre Cabanel, or studied at commercial enterprises like the Académie Julien, established by entrepreneurial artist teacher Rodolphe Julien in 1868 in the beautiful passages of central Paris. Thus, American artists, even those we associate with rebels like the Impressionists, exhibited at the Paris Salon. Mary Cassatt, James McNeil Whistler, and John Singer Sargent all submitted entries to the jury of the Paris Salon and were proud when their works were accepted, and even more so if they won a prize. Because Mary Cassatt was independently wealthy, and the relationship between independent wealth and innovation is a very important topic, she could, uh, she could join the secessionist impressionists, a group that came together only for exhibitions and defended no particular ideology. All of the impressionist exhibitions were economic disasters. Uh, but it didn't really matter for the independently wealthy artists who participated in them. What was more important was the critical attention they attracted. Cassatt, in fact, was also an important art collector, buying paintings by Degas in the 1880s and introducing Impressionist art to her friends in America. She also advised the wealthy banker James Stillman who bought numerous Impressionist paintings for his private collection. Like Copley and West before them, Whistler and Sargent found it more profitable to be based in Europe. Both made their, made their main living from painting portraits, as you see here, and the client base was much stronger in Europe. This was even true when Americans were their subjects. There was always something about being in Paris or London that inspired wealthy tourists, grand tourists, to have their portraits painted. For American artists living in Europe, social contacts were much more important than art dealers. Art dealers like Goupy and Durand Ruel, which annually sold about 70% of their stock, tended overwhelmingly to favor French artists. Those artists like Cassatt, Whistler, and Sargent, who circulated comfortably in high society and could make their own connections, became successful. Those who were unable failed. Of course, there was a growing number of artists in America in the decades around 1900 and an increasingly wealthy client base to support them. The collecting tendency, however, of the first generation of super-rich industrialists like the Vanderbilts, Carnegies, Rockefellers, Mellons, and Fricks was to imitate the patterns of old money and nobility collectors in Europe. They usually, and with the help of paid advisors 
really the first American art historians, they bought mainly old master paintings, as you see in the background of the portrait of Henry Clay Frick. Thanks to them, American museums house impressive collections of old master paintings. Sometimes as a result of travel to Europe and their openness to anti-establishment trends like Impressionism, uh, remember industrialists themselves were also entrepreneurial mavericks, they acquired outstanding collections of Impressionist art. Indeed, with the exception of the Impressionist artist Gustav Kayabat, who donated his own collection of French Impressionist painting uh, to the French government at his death in 1894, the largest and best collections of Impressionist painting were in America, where collectors like, liked artists who shared their modernist, modern direct and entrepreneurial spirit. The most important exhibition of Impressionist art in America occurred in 1886, the same year as the last Impressionist exhibition in Paris. And it occurred not because art dealers like James Sutton were interested in introducing European modern art to America, but rather because they had a lot of trouble selling Europe modern European, uh, selling American art to uh, American audiences. So James Sutton went to France. He visited the last Impressionist exhibition, which was held at Durand Ruel's gallery, and arranged to have 300 of those works, including Seurat's famous Sunday afternoon on the island of the Grand Jatte, shown at the American Art Association building on Madison Square. Durand Ruel did not want to have to ship the paintings back to Europe, so he had a sale. 15 paintings for $17,000, if you only were around in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, so pretty much all of the paintings sold. So that's really kind of the basis of the foundation of Impressionist art collections in the US. Uh, because Americans can't resist a bargain. Well, I guess who can? Another important opportunity to buy modern art in America occurred at the World's Columbian Exhibition in Chicago in 1893. The businesswoman and philanthropist Bertha Potter Palmer is, for instance, largely responsible for the magnificent collection of Impressionist and post-Impressionist painting at the Art Institute of Chicago which she began, and she began acquiring these works in 1893 at the uh, Columbian Exhibition. And here you see several works by Claude Monet, purchased by the Boston collector Denman Ross, and donated to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston in 1906, which started the first public collection of modern art in Boston. So there was actually a lot of anti-academic modern European art coming to America before 1900. But until it began to enter museum collections, it mostly remained hidden from public view. At the same time, there was a growing number of American artists, the products of the art academies in New York and Philadelphia, uh, but they had a difficult time finding patrons since European art was more attractive to rich Americans seeking to establish their legitimacy as a quasi-aristocratic social class in America. Some American artists wanted to create a singularly American school of art and focus on specifically American subject matter, which was also the goal of the Hudson River School in the mid-19th century. In the years around 1900, these artists chose to follow the realist legacy of Aikens uh, in their attention to ignored aspects of everyday life. But they also adopted a similar appearance of impulsiveness, rapidity, and attention to light uh, and atmosphere as the uh, Impressionists. These artists who were, uh, um, these artists who were not interested in formulating a cohesive national identity in the same way as European artists were, found themselves, at least in the beginnings of their career, working mainly as illustrators. This included the American Impressionist, Child Hassam, 
who worked as a children's book illustrator before his breakthrough exhibition of watercolors at the William, Williams and Everett Gallery in Boston. Frustrated, like the Impressionists several decades earlier, by the difficulty in finding exhibition opportunities and the opposition of the ostensibly progressive Society of American Artists, Hassam and nine colleagues formed a group in 1898 that they called the Ten. They may have been inspired by the example of the Twenty, or Les Vins, a secessionist group that formed in Brussels in 1883. The Ten were successful with both critics and collectors, and it really begins the openness of American collectors to collecting contemporary American art. <clears throat> As you can see from the selection of works by the best known artists among the Ten, they were profoundly influenced by the Impressionists. Several were, in fact, friends with Claude Monet, and they were all interested in documenting a similar bourgeois world of comfort, enjoyment, and harmony with nature as their French colleagues. The Ten did represent their own worlds, but perhaps more importantly, the worlds of individuals who could afford to buy their paintings. They represented a pleasant and carefree world that only the most privileged members of American society could enjoy. While the artists of the ten were painting the world of the haves, or the fortunate ones, uh, and ignoring the have-nots, uh, they ignored a large part of the world in the United States, a world in which thousands arrived daily from Europe after long voyages in steerage. Photographer Alfred Stieglitz illustrated the difference in living conditions in his photograph steerage, which shows the arrival of a bo boat to the port of New York. Uh, and you can see the affluent folks uh, upstairs and the not so affluent folks downstairs. New arrivals to New York were usually uh, directed to New York's Lower East Side where they lived and worked under unhealthy and dangerous circumstances. The photographer and social activist, uh, Jakob Ries, was profoundly disturbed by this situation, with people living under worse conditions than they had escaped in their homelands and treated as little more than animals. While few painters were interested in documenting these kind of squalid living conditions, they were, artists were fascinated by the bustling melting pot that was the Lower East Side. The group of artists interested in such lower class urban subjects is known as the ash can school, because it looked like the can where you'd throw your ashes. Uh, kind of a pejorative term. The founders of the ash can school, William Glackens, George Lukes, and John Sloan, became friends while studying at the Pennsylvania Academy in Philadelphia under uh, Robert Henry. And I know it looks like Henri, but in America we pronounce his name Henry. Uh, Robert Henry was related to Mary Cassatt and studied at the Pennsylvania Academy himself with Thomas Anschutz, um, who was a student of Aikens. And later he studied at the Académie Julien in Paris with Bouguereau, one of the most conservative and traditional academic artists in France. Henry saw and liked Impressionism and the works of artists like Jean-Francois Millet. When he returned to America in 1891, he began teaching in the Women's School of the Pennsylvania Academy and gradually lost his appreciation for Impressionism which he called a new academicism because of the tendency of younger artists to sim uh, simply imitate the appearance of Impressionism rather than its spirit. After all, the purpose of Impressionism was to describe modern life, especially the worlds and experiences of individual artists. As a result, Henry encouraged students to paint the world they lived in. For Henry, the artist, the modern artist should be a visual journalist, 
documenting all aspects of the rapidly paced modern world. Henry exhibited at the Paris Salon in 1899, and one of his paintings, La Neige, the Snow, for which I unfortunately could not find an image, was bought by the French government for its contemporary museum, the Musée du Luxembourg. So there was an openness in France sort of gradually for uh, the work of foreign artists. Having legitimized himself as a world-class artist at the Paris Salon, Henry returned to America, to New York, and in 1900, he began teaching at the New School of Art in 1902. His students included the pioneer uh, American artists, Joseph Stella, Edward Hopper, George Bellows, and Stuart Davis. Henry found New York a much more dynamic city than Philadelphia and the ideal place to evolve a new kind of art that reflected the constantly changing modern world as it appeared in the global melting pot of New York City. New York, during this time and perhaps ever since, remains, is the paradigm of America, a kind of metaphor for the nation as a whole, a place of many cultures, languages, and traditions where impoverished immigrants could become rich industrialists. All one needed was hustle, the imagination, and the drive to succeed. The period on which we're focusing, 1890 to 1918, saw the largest immigration, uh, largest amount of immigration ever to the United States. Statistics show that between 1890 and 1918, approximately 15% of the U.S. population was foreign born, and that percentage was much higher in New York, the main arrival point for immigrants. In works like Snow in New York, Henry shows the city almost paralyzed by a snowstorm. The usual busy streets are almost empty, except for several delivery vehicles and individuals. He emphasizes light and atmosphere like the Impressionists, and with his short, thick brush strokes, conveys the impression that this was painted quickly and on the spot. In Salome, Henry evoked the biblical story of the princess who, when requested to dance for King Herod, requested the head of St. John the Baptist as payment. Here, Henry created a metaphor for the more dangerous side of city life, not to mention the femme fatale. The temptations of the city presented in the guise of a belly dancer suggested the darkness and uncertainty that most city dwellers had to manage. Henry's students went in a variety of directions, some more attracted to specifically urban American subjects, others, like Joseph Stella, more attracted to European modernism. Stella was Italian, but is considered American because that's where he spent most of his career. I'm not sure what Italians think. Uh, his parents sent him to, to New York to study medicine, but like some of the Impressionists, he quickly gave up medicine to study art. After a few years at the Art Students League, where he studied with the American Impressionist William Merritt Chase, an example of whose work you see in the tiny image there, Stella, like his Ashcan school colleagues, worked as a newspaper illustrator. This was pretty much the standard around 1900. Stella didn't really like living in the US, which he called, and I quote, an enforced stay among enemies in a black funeral land with a merciless climate, end quote. A description that might also apply today. But he returned to Italy at a great moment, the birth of futurism. He met Giacomo Balla, Gino Severini, and was, was inspired by their ideas about speed, dynamism, and simultaneity. In 1911, Stella went to Paris, where he met Picasso and Brock, and most importantly, the siblings, Leo and Gertrude Stein. Stella incorporated the latest ideas in modern art into works like Battle of Lights, Coney Island, Mardi Gras. Coney Island is a section of Brooklyn, the borough of Brooklyn, uh, which is just adjacent to New York, 
connected by a bridge, uh, which is known for its beach and its amusement park. And here, Stella conveys the multiple sensations, the lights, the movement, the joyful chaos, even the noise of this pre-Lenten celebration. Stuart Davis, another student, um, while relatively timid in the period before World War I, became a leading American modernist. His greatest masterpiece, Swing Landscape, which captures visually the vibrant music of the swing era, is the most important work in the collection of my home university, uh, Indiana University. So the rich Americans, Gertrude Stein, uh, Gertrude Stein and her brother Leo, were the children of a wealthy, of wealthy Jewish businessman. They moved to Paris in 1902 and lived in a spacious apartment in the fashionable 6th arrondissement. Through the art historian and collector of Renaissance art, Bernard Berenson, the Steins met uh, Paul Cezanne and the publisher and art dealer, Ambrose, uh, Ambroise Vollard. Vollard, in turn, introduced uh, the Steins to the Parisian art world. The siblings started an art collection in 1904 with 8,000 francs, which enabled them to buy a lot of art, uh, including paintings by Gauguin, Renoir, and Cezanne. Not especially materialistic otherwise, but fanatical about art, they ex soon expanded their collection to include works by Honoré Daumier, Henri Matisse, Pierre Bonnard, and Toulouse-Lautrec. The Stein's older brother, Michael, was also an avid art collector and specialized in Matisse. Their close friends, the sisters Clara Bell and Edda Cohn, also amassed an enormous collection of contemporary art, which they donated to the Baltimore Museum of Art. In addition, in addition to their collecting activities, the Steins held a salon on Saturday evenings that attracted writers, artists, journalists, critics, intellectuals, musicians, and politicians. Among the attendees were Picasso, Matisse, Francis Picabia, and the writers Ernest Hemingway, Ernest Hemingway F. Scott Fitzgerald, Sinclair Lewis, Ezra Pound, René Cravel, and various Parisian and American friends. In 1914, Leo moved to Italy, and so their collection was divided. Both Leo and Gertrude bought new works, sold old ones. They had a very dynamic attitude towards art. Um, and so unfortunately, there is no single museum with a Stein collection. A group of Henry Henry's students, William Glackens, George Lukes, and uh, John Sloan, began working as newspaper illustrators in Philadelphia. But by 1904, they also relocated to New York. After all, that was where the action was. Um, the moment when Henry and his students formed a coherent group identity uh, was at least in the public imagination, was in 1908, during the course of a show that was held at the Macbeth Gallery, located at 450 Fifth Avenue, and then which later traveled to nine American cities. The gallery founder, William Macbeth, wanted to promote American art among the working and middle classes, which is why he traveled the show to so many cities. He felt that images related to the daily life of people would appeal most to them. Henry, Glackens, Lukes, and Sloan were joined, joined by four other artists, earning them the straightforward title, The Eight. Most of the eight were politically, in, uh, were pol politically progressive socialists. Sloan, for instance, directly engaged with politics and made frequent illustrations for the socialist journal, The Masses, documenting scandalous incidents of government abuse, such as the Ludlow Massacre, an incident when the Colorado National Guard attacked a tent camp of miners who were protesting dangerous conditions in a coal mine owned by John D. Rockefeller, Jr. 
In this little event, they killed more than two dozen people, including women and children. It's the American way. Another member of the eight, Arthur B. Davies, was born in a small city in New York State, where he saw as a child an exhibition of the Hudson River School, an experience that decided his future. As you can see in Dancing Children, his early works were inspired by Barbizon School naturalism, as was practiced by Hudson River uh, artists, school artists, especially George Innes. Davies married a wealthy woman, Virginia Merriweather, so he didn't really have to worry about selling his art, uh, who became one of America's first female doctors. Interestingly, uh, Davies was also a bigamist with two completely different families, wives, children, homes, a situation that was only discovered when he died in 1928. Davies was certainly a busy man. Uh, he was successful from the very beginning of his artistic career, however, thanks to the support of New York gallerist William Macbeth. So Macbeth played a really crucial role uh, in promoting American art in the first decade of the 20th century. Uh, and Davies was also one of the organizers of the Armory Show in 1913, which I'll talk about shortly. Another important private institution uh, in the first decade of the, and second decade of the 20th century was Alfred Stieglitz's 291 Gallery, which was the first gallery to bring truly contemporary European as well as non-Western art to American audiences. Stieglitz was a photographer and a member of the pictorialist movement, which promoted the acceptance of photography as a fine art rather than judging it as a mechanical scientific pursuit. When Stieglitz returned to New York from Europe in 1905, after about a decade abroad, fellow pictorialist Edward Steichen was living in an apartment at 291 Fifth Avenue. The two had discussed opening an exhibition space for showcasing photo secessionist artists. And Stieglitz, who was independently wealthy, decided to rent three rooms on the fifth floor of 291 Fifth Avenue. Gallery 291 existed from 1905 until 1917, and during that time was the most important American venue for contemporary foreign art. In 1908, Gallery 291 uh, moved to a smaller space in a neighboring building. Uh, but up until then, Stieglitz exhibited uh, mostly works by photo secessionists at home and abroad, including the German and English artists Gertrude Kesebeer and Clarence White, as you see here. Afterwards, after 1908, he began introducing contemporary artists working in other media, including Picasso, Rodin, and Matisse, as well as contemporary American artists like the sculptor Ellie Nadelman and the painter Georgia O'Keeffe, who became his life partner. The exhibition that had the greatest impact on modern, modern expressionist sculpture in America was the exhibition of African sculpture held at Stieglitz's 291 gallery in November 1914. It was a loan show from a London gallery and directly affected Arthur B. Davies, who became, began carving wood immediately afterwards. In 1903, Stieglitz established the quarterly journal Camera Work, which promoted photography as fine art. Extremely expensive to produce, none of it actually earned any money. Uh, it continued until 1917, with a total of 50 issues and 473 photographs published. And it is one of the most important documents regarding the introduction of modernism to America. Without a doubt, though, the single most important event in American art during the period 1890 to 1918 was the 1913 Armory Show, a month-long exhibition held in February to March 1913. 
It was called the Armory Show because it was held in the 69th Regiment Armory of the U.S. National Guard, a building located on Lexington Avenue and 26th Street. The actual title of the exhibition, as you see here, was the International Exhibition of Modern Art. The show later traveled to Boston and Chicago. It was organized by the Association of American Painting, Painters and Sculptors and brought hundreds of works of modern and contemporary art from Europe, from Van Gogh and Gauguin uh, to Matisse and Brancusi and Picasso. This was the very first time the American public saw contemporary works that we now understand as landmarks of modernism. The idea for the Armory Show was similar to that of earlier exhibitions elsewhere, like the secessions in Vienna, Munich, Berlin, and Levin in Belgium. Organizers selected what they considered the most important recent trends from abroad and exhibited these works alongside American artists whom they deemed contemporary domestic pioneers, including Davies, Maurice Prendergast, and Henry. American artists, American works did look rather provincial in comparison to what was happening in Paris, as evidenced by this comparison uh, between Henry's nude study and Marcel Duchamp's nude descending a staircase from 1912, both of which appeared at the Armory Show. But as historians, of course, it is important to understand works of art in their larger sociocultural context, not merely to judge them provincial by comparison with works produced in a place that had very different circumstances. The important thing about the Armory Show was not that it demonstrated how provincial American art was in 1913, but rather because it gave a phenomenal energy injection to those young American artists who saw it, and because it was a catalyst to rich American collectors to be a bit more daring in their collecting activity. The exhibition, the only one the association ever organized, was the idea of Walt Kuhn, Walter Pach, and Arthur B. Davies. Together with Ashcan School artists William Glackens and George Lukes, they formed the Association of American Painters and Sculptors in 1912. Pach studied with Henry and American Impressionist William Merritt Chase. He moved to Paris in 1907 and joined the Stein Circle. Pach produced, uh, participated in several group exhibitions in Paris with the Section d'Or, which included Marcel Duchamp and his brothers Raymond and Jacques Villon, as well as Albert Glaise and Jean Messanger. Pac, however, was interested in criticism primarily and promotion from the very beginning. He wrote the very first article in English uh, on Cezanne, published in America in 1908, and shortly afterward he published an interview with Monet, Pach also wrote the first important study in English on Seurat, as well as an important uh, monograph on, on Van Gogh, and he was the first to translate the journals of Eugène Delacroix into English. Following the Armory Show, Pach became the main advisor to Walter and Louise Ahrensberg, whose collection, along with that of Catherine Dreyer, became the basis of the Philadelphia Museum of Art's modernist collection. Pach introduced the Ehrensbergs to Marcel Duchamp in 1915, and together they formed a new group, a lot of group forming in America, a new group, the Society of Independent Artists. But back to the Armory Show. In 1912, Pach and Kuhn went to Europe in order to find works for the show. After they returned, they invited uh, an equal number of American artists to participate. The show included 13 paintings and sculptures by more than 300 artists, and about half of these were Americans. 
During the two-month run in New York, the show attracted an audience of 275,000 visitors. There was also great variety in the works shown at the Armory. The organizers wanted to produce a broad and representative selection of all the various trends from the past 30 years. Cezanne's view of the Domaine Saint-Joseph, painted in 1888, was shown at the Armory Show and was the first modern painting purchased by a major American museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. It was a great choice. Here one sees clearly what John Rewald called Cezanne's constructive stroke, those small bricks of color with which he created his paintings. Domaine Saint-Joseph is also important in Cezanne's career uh, because it represents an early example of this unusual technique. Perhaps the most detested painting in the Armory Show, though, this was not detested at all, loved, uh, was Duchamp's New Distending a Staircase, which one critic compared to an explosion in a shingle factory. Much of the sculpture at the Armory Show was relatively traditional and based on the human figure. Mayol and Rodin were both represented by one work each, and Lembrouck and Matisse streamlined the female form in their own ways. But Matisse would later progress much further in simplifying the human body in his, uh, the continuation of his series in Bax 2, 3, and 4, which he produced during the course of the next two decades. Picasso's cubist portrait of Fernand, where normative facial contours are sacrificed to a dynamic surface of projecting and receding planes, confused viewers who saw, found it coarse and amateurish. Lembrook's figure was described by American President Theodore Roosevelt as a, resembling the insect praying mantis. Uh, but the sculptures of Brancusi got the most attention. He exhibited three works, including the famous 1907 Kiss, and one critic complained about Brancusi's uh, Madame Pogani, a work we now consider almost spiritual in its smooth and simplified surfaces. This critic described it as, quote, a hard-boiled egg balanced on a cube of sugar, end quote. And the Ukrainian sculptor Archipenko's magnificent two-meter-high plaster, Family Life, bothered viewers because of its entangled and confused uh, figures and its exaggerated proportions. President Roosevelt would probably have loved Twitter as much as Donald Trump does. He had many interesting and negative comments about modernist art exhibited at the Armory Show. In addition to comparing Lembrook's woman to an insect, he referred to cubists as, quote, knights of the isosceles triangle, and along with the futurists, the lunatic fringe of European extremists. But his opinions did reflect those of mainstream Americans who wanted to see art that was descriptive rather than expressive or intellectual. But the Armory Show was actually not intended to shock at all, but rather to function as an educational opportunity. And educating the American public, art education was very important to uh, museums and to gallerists uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. The Armory exhibition actually provided viewers with several exemplary publications and a mini retrospective of 19th century art intended to ease viewers into the new movements. The four central galleries of the Armory show began with works by the titans of French academic painting, Ingres, Delacroix, and Daumier, and then progressed uh, through Impressionism and ending with key post-Impressionist artists, Cézanne, Gauguin, and Van Gogh. But the shock of seeing so many varied contemporary movements all at the same time and in the same place was confusing and disturbing to American audiences 
who are accustomed to being introduced gradually to European trends, one at a time, in slow succession, a process that gave them time to become acclimated to new tendencies. They were not used to being confronted with shockingly different art that they had trouble recognizing and understanding. In America, education and the promotion of democratic, egalitarian values was important. In the second half of the 19th century, the development of museum schools and art journals aimed to create broad-based public support for the arts. Similar thing happened in Germany. As one critic insisted in the 1870s, quote, the only safety is in a multitude of judges. Our faith in average perceptions, in average taste, is strong. And we believe that the critics are more likely in the end to accept the opinions of average people than average people are likely to accept the opinions of critics. End quote. A little scary, but there you go. Uh, while some critics were concerned with esoteric uh, aesthetic concerns, with the obvious agenda of creating a professional profile for art critics, making art criticism into a specialized occupation, others were more concerned with the overall implications of, for instance, the Armory Show. A reviewer for the journal Overlook, Outlook commented that, quote, the association's effort has already accomplished two very welcome results for which we should be appreciative. It has shown conclusively that a large, interesting selection of pictures attracts many viewers, and second, that when those pictures are selected to demonstrate particular theories, they provoke instant, lively, and helpful discussion. That the present exhibition will popularize painting no one can doubt, even if it doesn't popularize the latest tendencies in painting." End quote. Many critics were mainly concerned with the Armory Show as an important educational opportunity that brought art to the people and provided a model for other institutions to follow. A reviewer for the New York Times argued that for critics, quote, there should be no such thing as taking sides. He can heartily detest the eccentricities of a Matisse, and he can find his soul moved to something approaching ecstasy by the serene and noble rhythms of Puvis de Chavan. But so can any one of us. The critic's more dispassionate task is to try to discover what additions each of the innovators in the various schools has made to the sum of artistic achievement. What change has each one made to the prevailing taste of his time? And what step has he taken to broaden our perceptions?" End quote. Visitors to the Armory Show, who were both open-minded and wealthy, found great opportunities to start their art collections. Indeed, some of America's most important collectors got their start at the Armory Show. These include Catherine Dreyer, Walter and Louise Ahrensberg, Lily Bliss, and Albert Barnes, whose collection stayed intact and is now housed at the Barnes Collection in Philadelphia. The final exhibitions I'll mention are the 1917 exhibitions organized by the Society of Independent Artists, an unjuried show held at the Grand Central uh, Place, and the Forward Exhibition of May 1917, organized by the People's Art Guild and held in the building organ owned by the socialist Jewish American and Yiddish language newspaper, Forwärts. <coughs> Forward. The so Society of Independence, Independent Artists show uh, was influenced by the socialist sympathies of its organizers and was a show with no jury and no prizes. Artworks were hung in alphabetical order by the artist's last name in order to make the exhibition as democratic as possible. The one exception to this uh, was the submission of Marcel Duchamp, which he made under the alias, the fake name, R. Mutt. 
And since Mutt was an unfamiliar artist, uh, unrecognized, and he presented a challenging object, uh, one which he bought in a store, uh, which this unknown artist presented was extraordinary, and it was the only work rejected from the show. It introduced an entirely new concept of art, as we all know now, you know, sort of the father of minimalism, among other things. It introduced the concept of the ready-made, which could be considered either as evidence of a cynical attitude towards creativity, <coughs> as many people at the time thought, or as a celebration of idea over handicraft, as we like to think today. The Forward exhibition restricted itself to only American artists, 89 in total, and it mixed painting and photography in a way that was unprecedented, so a very egalitarian, democratic approach to exhibiting. It included 89 works in total, um, 89 artists in total, including Stieglitz, Henry, Stella, Sloan, Benton, and the young modernists Marston Hartley and John Marin. The People's Art Guild, founded in 1915 by the anarchist educator Dr. John Weichsel, wanted to get around the elitist commercial gallery system and bring art directly to the public because he believed in its ability to elevate human sensibilities and to promote empathy. Unlike other art organizations of the time, the Guild's membership was open to anyone, artist or not, who paid dues, and the dues were $1. Between 1915 and 1918, the People's Art Guild organized more than 50 exhibitions, and its membership grew to 300. No single style or group dominated any of the Guild exhibitions, and the shows were held uh, in the Lower East Side neighborhood where most immigrants lived. The exhibitions were all free and open from 10 in the morning until 10 in the evening, seven days a week, allowing the working classes the opportunity to visit them, a situation unlike exhibitions anywhere else, including those held by the Society of Independent Artists, uh, who might have professed to want to uh, exhibit art for the general public, but the real agenda was to attract at our affluent art patrons. Well, here, I hope, not too abruptly, I will end my survey of the American art world, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions you might have. Thank you.